We come to Genesis 48, uh, nearly in the home stretch here with our uh, sermons, various sermon series on the book of Genesis, nearing uh, the end. And we come really to the last words and testament of Jacob. Over, the la- over these next two chapters, these two Sundays, uh, we'll see what Jacob has to say as his final words. And so before we read uh, Genesis 48, let us pray. Heavenly Father, we do ask now that as we come to these words, as we read of a man who is approaching death, uh, the words that he says and the hope that he has, knowing that there is more to this life. And so, Father, we pray as we would see the same, would we know much about the Lord Jesus Christ and about the kingdom that is coming. We pray all of that in his name. Amen. So Genesis 48. After this, Joseph was told, Behold, your father is ill. So he took with him his two sons, Manasseh and Ephraim. And it was told to Jacob, Your son Joseph has come to you. Then Israel summoned his strength and sat up in bed. And Jacob said to Joseph, God Almighty appeared to me at Luz in the land of Canaan and blessed me and said to me, Behold, I will make you fruitful and multiply you, and I will make of you a company of peoples and will give this land to your offspring after you for an everlasting possession. And now your two sons who were born to you in the land of Egypt before I came to you in Egypt are mine. Ephraim and Manasseh shall be mine, as Reuben and Simeon are. And the children that you fathered after them shall be yours. They shall be called by the name of their brothers in their inheritance. As for me, when I came to Paddan, to my sorrow, Rachel died in the land of Canaan on the way, where, when there was still some distance to go to Ephrath, and I buried her there on the way to Ephrath, that is, Bethlehem. When Israel saw Joseph's sons, he said, Who are these? Joseph said to his father, They are my sons, whom God has given me here. And he said, Bring them to me, please, that I may bless them. Now the eyes of Israel were dim with age, so that he could not see. So Joseph brought them near him, and he kissed them and embraced them. And Israel said to Joseph, I never expected to see your face. And behold, God has let me see your offspring also. Then Joseph removed them from his knee, and he bowed himself with his face to the earth. And Joseph took them both, Ephraim in the right hand towards Israel's left, and Manasseh in his left hand towards Israel's right, and brought them near him. And Israel stretched out his right hand and laid it on the head of Ephraim, who was the younger, and his left hand on the head of Manasseh crossing his hands, for Manasseh was the firstborn. And he blessed Joseph and said, The God before whom my fathers Abraham and Isaac walked, the God who has been my shepherd all my life long to this day, the angel who has redeemed me from all evil, bless the boys. And in them let my name be carried on, and the name of my fathers Abraham and Isaac, and let them grow into a multitude, In the midst of the earth. Then Joseph saw that his father laid his right hand on the head of Ephraim. It displeased him, and he took his father's hand to move it from Ephraim's head to Manasseh's head. And Joseph said to his father, Not this way, my father, since this one is on the firstborn, you put your hand on his head. But his father refused and said, I know, my son, I know. He also shall become a people, and he shall be great. Nevertheless, his younger brother shall be greater than he, and his offspring shall become a multitude of nations. So he blessed them that day, saying, By you Israel will pronounce blessings, saying, God make you as Ephraim and Manasseh. Thus he put Ephraim before Manasseh. Then Israel said to Joseph, Behold, I am about to die, but God will be with you and will bring you again to the land of your fathers. Moreover, I have given to you rather than to your brothers one mountain slope that I took from the hand of the Amorites with my sword and with my bow. Amen. Well, as we come to these, the beginning of Jacob's last words and testament, we have before us uh, a rather strange scene and, and one that 
if I'm honest, has always perplexed me. Uh, because you'll know that there are 12 sons that are born to Jacob, who then comprise the 12 tribes of Israel. Yet if you remember, as you move along, there actually is no tribe of Joseph, though occasionally they'll, uh, the, the northern kingdom will be referred to as the tribe of Joseph. It's the tribe of Ephraim. And then even stranger, you have then a half-tribe of Manasseh. And so suddenly you have this interesting situation where you have 12 tribes, but sort of 13 tribes or 12 and a half tribes. And it is a bit strange to me. In some sense, what's happening here is we're simply hearing the historical uh, account of what the later Israelites know. They, they know that there is a tribe called Ephraim and a tribe called Manasseh, as they are in uh, the land of Egypt, as they are suffering as slaves, they have become a great multitude. And so now, in some sense, we're, we're going backwards in time to explain why there's a tribe called Ephraim and not Joseph, and why there's a half-tribe called Manasseh. And so we have Jacob here who is ill. Uh, he seems to understand that he is dying. And so he wants to set his affairs in order. And the first one is, is to bring Joseph with his two sons. And so in the first seven verses, we have this rehearsal of the past. Uh, as Joseph is dying, sorry, as Jacob is dying, he gives forth this really last will and testament of these promises of what will come after him. And so he begins by rehearsing his journey. Uh, you'll remember as uh, jo Jacob fled from his family in order to avoid being murdered by Esau, uh, on his journey, he comes to Bethel, and there God meets him and promises him and, and reiterates the promises that he had given to his forefathers and tells Jacob that God will be with him throughout all his days. And so he goes, and then you'll note the way in which uh, Jacob then comes back near at the end, speaking of the time in which Rachel died, and he's, he's really bookending his sojournings. So you have him leaving the land of Canaan, meeting God there, and then his return back to Canaan and the death of Rachel. And then sandwiched in the middle of this, we have this formal adoption of uh, Manasseh and Ephraim. And you'll note the way in which he is rehearsing the past. He's not discounting the sufferings that he's gone through, but he's framing those all in the ways in which God has been with him. That the promises that God has given, that he would have a land and he would be fruitful and multiply, he is starting to see that come true. And think about what God had promised him. And here you have these two children standing before him as a testimony to the, the fact that God is indeed fulfilling his promise to make him a great people. And so here then Jacob formally adopts Ephraim and Manasseh uh, so that these children will actually inherit with Joseph's brothers. Uh, apparently this was something that was done in the ancient Near East where a grandfather would adopt his grandchildren as full children. And it's likely, it simply just has to do with inheritance and with carrying on the name. Because if you think now, Ephraim and Manasseh will be counted as uh, clan heads. And so really from Joseph's perspective, what you end up happening here is this great honor is given to him. That his father takes these two so that if you think about the other heads of the clans, there's only one clan that comes from them. Yet it's Joseph who has two, and additional, it would be end up being, there'd be additional land grants to them. You'll think of the ways in which the Levites don't take any land, but Ephraim and Manasseh both inherit land in Canaan. And so you have here this adoption, this great time in which I think uh, Jacob is just simply honoring Joseph. Uh, honoring Joseph for all that he has done, and here he is adopting these two children in order that they themselves would be great and clans would, would come from them. Uh, and as I said, he then in verse 7, he bookends his journeys with God who is with him and then the, the sad death of Rachel. 
And so again, Jacob is recounting God's promises. He's recounting the way in which God has been at work in his life. And here he stands in front of the two children of Joseph as a testimony that God is indeed doing this. And yet you'll also note, though, the way in which he doesn't shy away from the difficulties of life. Remember Pharaoh earlier, how many days, basically, how old are you? Well, my days have been few and they have been evil. They have been hard. There has been very difficult things that have taken place in Jacob's life. But he's balancing that with the way in which God has provided and has blessed him. And again, something he would never expect to see Joseph again, yet now he sees Joseph and Joseph's offspring. And so I think there's that tension here where God is is at work and he's blessing and he's helping. And we can all testify to that in our own lives, the way in which God has, has blessed us and helped us. But the Bible never uh, glosses over the difficulties of life, the loss of Rachel, the way in which uh, Jacob's life has been hard. And he has never seemed to have rest. He is constantly on the move, and now his last days he's dying in a foreign land and telling his son to bury him back in the land of promise. The writer to Hebrews seems to understand that what's behind the scenes is that there's something more that's being hoped for. Again, Jacob has to be looking past his earthly life to something more. The writer of Hebrews says this in Hebrews 11, These all died in faith, not having received the things promised, but having seen them and greeted them from afar, and having acknowledged that they were strangers and exiles on the earth. For people who speak thus make it clear that they are seeking a homeland. And if they had been thinking of that land from which they had gone out, they would have opportunity to return. But as it is, they desire a better country, that is, a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared for them a city. Note the way that the writer of Hebrews is, is seeing what clearly is, is there under the surface, that Jacob is looking for something greater than just simply the return to Canaan. He's looking at the way in which God will fulfill these promises. Well, then you have this blessing and adoption in verses 8 through 16. And again, the, the scene, it, it harkens back. You have the blind patriarch, and you've got the two children before him. This is very much like uh, Isaac with Jacob, sorry, yeah, with Jacob and with Esau. Though there's a, a stark difference here is that while Isaac was tricked, uh, Jacob is willfully blessing these two boys, and he pulls this uh, switch, uh, which will greatly upset Joseph. But he has this great blessing from God. In, in verse 11, he blesses God. He says, I never expected to see your face, and behold, God has let me see your offspring also. So he brings the children in and Israel asks, who are these children? I mean, on the one hand, he is blind, but on the other hand, it does seem that this is part of a, a formal process. Almost like a, a wedding ceremony when they ask, who is giving the bride? We all know the answer to this. And here we know the answer, these two sons, but I think it's here as a, as a, as a bit of a ceremony as he brings these two children and you can see the way in which Joseph puts them so that uh, Manasseh is at Israel's right hand and uh, Ephraim is at his left hand. And Israel stretches out his hands and he crosses them. And then he says this, uh, this wonderful prayer, this wonderful blessing. Uh, the God before, before whom my fathers Abraham and Isaac walked, the God who has been my shepherd all my life long to this day, the angel who has redeemed me, from all evil. You'll note the way he begins this blessing by simply going back and rehearsing again who it is that does the blessing. The reason that the blessing of the patriarch is, is effective in any way is because there is God who is behind them with his promises and his power to do this. And so he speaks of his life as one like Abraham's and one like Isaac's in which they were wanderers, they were sojourners. 
But in that sojourning, they walked with God. It brings us all the way back to Enoch, whom his short little vignette of his life is simply he walked with God. And that was a testimony to his life. And here the patriarchs, they walked with God. They walked with God. And then he speaks of God who has been his shepherd. So not only has, has they, have they walked with God, but God has walked with them. God has shepherded them. And Isaac, Abraham and Isaac and Jacob all being shepherds. They know what it's like to move and maneuver sheep over vast areas. And here, speaking of God as their great shepherd, the one who has herded them and directed them and guided them and protected them, it would be a metaphor that they could very easily understand. And all my life to this very day, God has been with me, is his testimony. And even going so far as to say the angel has redeemed me from all evil. And here he's meaning the angel of the Lord. You'll remember he wrestles with uh, somebody. He uh, sees God in some kind of physical way. God has appeared to him. And here he speaks of this angel who has redeemed him from all evil. And again, it's, it's interesting to put this together with what came before it, where he is being interviewed by Pharaoh and he speaks of his days of his life as being evil. And here saying, well, God has redeemed me from all evil. And you'll, you'll note that word there, redeemed, is a, is a fantastic word. It is a word of, of uh, this exchange, this redemption that happens. You'll think of the way in which Boaz redeems Ruth and cares for her, the way the Lord Jesus redeems his people. And here he seems to have the idea not that his life has been free from evil, from sadness, from heartbreak and suffering and all of that. He's just stated multiple times that his life has been that. And I think what he's getting at here, though, is simply that the Lord has, has brought out of that evil, that sadness, the difficulties, the death. He's brought out of that something good. He's continued to uphold his promise to his people. He has been with Jacob all his days and will be with Jacob to the end even when he passes from this life. And yet he is not done with being with Jacob's posterity. The, really, the story of Genesis is that, that movement from individuals to a corporate people and the way in which God continues to be with them throughout that transition. And then he's, he, he then prays, bless these boys, and that his name would be carried on the name of my fathers, Abraham and Isaac. And indeed, you'll think of Jacob's name as it's changed over to Israel. His name will be carried on very literally as it'll be the people of Israel. But it'll also just be carried through as people will remember the patriarchs and God's way in which he has dealt with them, that they'll refer to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob in that way as a constant reminder of God's past faithfulness. They'll call upon Jacob's name in order to be reminded of the way in which the God of Jacob has acted. And then finally, he ends with this blessing and promise that they would grow into a multitude in the midst of the earth, that in the land they would grow into a mighty people. And this has been God's promise of, of land and of seed. And here he's praying this. But you have this then strange situation where he changes his hands. And you'll remember the way in which these blessings, they seem to be irrevocable once they're done. So Esau, who wanted the blessing back after he'd sold it, is unable to retain it because it is a, it, a one-time transaction. That it was, it was sent and it was done and it was pronounced upon Jacob and it cannot be revoked. And so that would be why Joseph here is displeased, and it's actually a pretty strong word. He seems to be bubbling a bit with anger, but having to control himself because of his aging, dying father in front of him. But he is, he's upset that his father has pronounced the great blessing on the younger son, which is not something that is supposed to happen yet. It has been the constant theme of Genesis. You have Cain and Abel, where Abel is preferred the younger over the older. You have Isaac over Ishmael, and then, of course, Jacob over Esau, and now you have Ephraim 
over Manasseh. In many ways, you read this and you almost would be shocked if it went the normal order of things. It would be more shocking if Manasseh, as the firstborn, received it. But Joseph says, as, as Joseph tries to correct his aging and ailing and blind father, that you must have made a mistake, Dad. <laughs> let, me, let me fix your hands here. Jacob responds, no, I know what I'm doing. And also he, as a, as a, as a prophet, it seems, knows what is going to happen. That seems to be the reason for the hands being switched is that Jacob knows or has this inkling or this gut feeling or whatever you want to call it. He seems to know that, that Ephraim will be greater than Manasseh. And so Ephraim then is blessed as the firstborn son. And you'll see even the, the difference in the way in which he speaks of these two uh, clans. He said, his younger shall be greater his offspring shall be called a multitude of nations. And he'll speak of Manasseh saying that he will become a great people, whereas Ephraim will have this multitude of nations. Ephraim will be greater by far over Manasseh. And so then we end up with the land in Canaan. After Jacob blesses the children again by saying, by you Israel will be pronounced blessings, saying, God make you as Ephraim and Manasseh. He blesses them with what sounds like a proverb. Uh, he blesses them by saying that you will be blessed, but also you will be remembered for posterity's sake as a blessing. You will be remembered as those to whom God poured the blessing out upon you, so much so it will become a proverb later and, a, and really a proverbial blessing that you would say to others, may God make you like Ephraim and Manasseh because they have been blessed. It's interesting. He, he is making this blessing. He is assuming that it will be carried out and going so far as to say others will then look back on this blessing as a way to bless others. And so he's, he's not only saying it will come true, but it will come true in such a way that people will long remember this. And so then at the end, he tells Joseph he's about to die. But then he makes this promise, God will be with you and will bring you again to the land of your fathers. So as this promise that was given to Jacob, now Jacob passes that promise on to Joseph and to the other brothers. And that God will be with them. And again, you think of the, the audience here who is, is reading this account as Moses is writing it are the Israelites 400 plus years later in captivity and bondage. And here they have read this continuation of this story as God has been with his people time and time and time and time again. And here Israel says, God is with you, Joseph. And really meaning God is with you and these people who will come for you. And then in verse 22, he ends this section by telling Joseph that he has given him a plot of land, a, a mountain slope, um, or the word could be actually Shechem. And so he's given him this land in the land of Canaan. And the text doesn't really tell us why he's done this. Some commentators think that it's possible that as Joseph is the one who has seen all of the glory of Egypt, the most powerful man in all of the land and the, the wealth and the splendor and all of that that's before him. Here, Jacob gives him this land as a, as a testimony or as a reminder of who he is and the inheritance that is better than Egypt could ever offer. But it does seem as if it would be a, a pale comparison, wouldn't it? From an earthly perspective, you can have all of the power, the wealth, of Egypt or this mountain in this land you barely remember. But yet, I think that's what Jacob is doing. He is reminding Joseph tangibly of the promise of God. He's been saying this, that God will fulfill this promise by bringing you back to the land. He will fulfill his promise by making you into a great people. And here is this land almost sacramentally as a reminder now through the rest of Joseph's life, so much so that Joseph will end his life just as the way that Jacob did. That his desire will not be to be buried in Egypt, but that he will be taken back 
with the exiles as they return to the land. As that Exodus generation goes, they will be carrying the bones of Joseph with them. And here this land, I think, is just that further reminder of really where his, his um, heart should be in the promise of God. And so we end here with the first part of Joseph's, of Jacob's last will and testament. Next week, we'll be looking at the blessing he gives to his sons. And then following that is the burial, uh, death and burial of jo- Jacob and then Joseph, which brings us to the end of Genesis. But as we sit here and contemplate here, it's, it really is, this is a, a time in which to reflect upon Jacob's life. Because after this, it will really be that transition to Jacob's sons and what will happen for them in the future. That will be chapter 49. But here we look at the life of Jacob and several questions I think that we can ponder or think on. Of One of those is certainly, do you know this shepherd? You think of the way in which Jacob's life was lived. Sometimes he caused his own problems. Sometimes plenty of problems were thrown Upon him, yet at the end of his life, he can see God's provision for him. He can see the way God has redeemed his, uh, all the evil that has happened to him. He can say that every day of my life, God was with me. It's a wonderful testimony, and it's one in which, too, he, he looks beyond the earthly inheritance to something greater and something better, and that, that only happens with a, a, a true faith that can see past these things. I mean, how else does Jacob get through all of the difficulties of his life and able to say, God was with me. He shepherded me. There's a, there's a kindness. There's a fatherliness. There's a, a way in which God has shown his love and care for Jacob. And here at the end of his life, he says, yes, there was evil. But there was goodness because there was God. And the question is, do you know this shepherd? It's no wonder that Jesus is called the great shepherd. It's no wonder that he comes in order to rescue his people. Like lost sheep, he gathers them together and he fends off those who would attack and he he nurtures and cares for them. And you get these lovely passages in the New Testament of of a single solitary sheep that bolts, 99 sheep who need to be protected. And probably the wise shepherd would say, we'll cut our losses. But that's not how Jesus acts. Jesus goes to rescue the one. Do you know this shepherd? And then have you been walking with this shepherd? Note the way in in which it isn't just God who is with Jacob, but is Jacob who is with God. The Psalms, Psalm 1 speaks about the way in which uh, David walks and tells the way in which he does not walk on the path of the wicked, but he walks in the way of righteousness, and he is planted and, and nourished and produces this great fruit and abundance of life and righteousness. And there's also this question of, do we walk with this shepherd? And then can you testify to God's faithfulness, even in the midst of hardship? Again, I think it's human, (laughs) it is being human is to experience hardships, difficulties, and times in which it is just difficult. And yet Joseph experienced, Jacob experienced all of this, yet testifies nonetheless to God's faithfulness. And I think all of that finally just gets us to this last question, which is, do you know where you're going? Think about what would have got Jacob through all of this. It is not a plot of land and some children, as great as those things are. But there's something more that he longs for. There's something more that Abraham longed for because all of them never received the full inheritance, the fullness of all that God promised them. And that could have caused them to die in bitterness, but rather they seem to have this assumption that God didn't fulfill it in my lifetime, It just means that somehow he's still going to fulfill it. (laughs) This was what what Abraham's hope was. Yes, I'll kill Isaac, but well, God promised him, so he'll fix it. (laughs) And I think here is the same thing that Jacob knew that there was something more. 
He knew that he was going someplace. He, he simply knew that there were promises left unfulfilled that death itself couldn't stop. And so do you know where you're going? Do you know where you're going? Do you know this shepherd? Do you walk with this shepherd? Can you testify to his faithfulness? And do you know that he is coming again? And he's coming again like that wonderful shepherd for those lost sheep in order to <laughs> really wrap you up and bring you into his new creation. And that's the storyline of the Bible. And here we see it in, in microcosm in the life of Jacob. But Jacob's life is just simply a testimony that every saint can have on their deathbed. And it's wonderful to know that and to remember that and to keep striving on knowing that there is more to life past even our death. There's a city that God is building and that one day it will be complete and all of his people will dwell there with him, walking in his presence. It speaks of there's no need of a son because the glory of the sun is there in their midst. There's no temple because there is unfettered access and worship to God forever and ever. So brothers and sisters, let us know where we are going and the Savior who waits on us. Let us pray.